The reason why I started doing Just Veins is Mike Riddle in 2008. He cracked my chest and put a new valve. So I decided to sl slow down on my life. It's not what I'm advising you guys. You are in training. You need to learn everything that you need to. And you can't do in the next few years because it's the only time you're going to have this awesome experience. So let's go over the numbers real quick because I know slides after slides, numbers and numbers and numbers, and then you go and you forget about everything. So I want to give you just the pointers, the highlights that I have learned in my practice because I do 100% veins. I don't do any arterial stuff. I miss arterial stuff, but you cannot do both. And we can discuss or argue over that later, but you cannot do arterial and vein successfully. If you want to do just half acid there, that's fine, but you can do it. You cannot do it successfully. So anyway, uh, venous vein disease, 27% approximately in all the adults of the United States. Uh, 70 to 90% of the ulcers in the lower extremity are caused by this problem. And obviously it's very expensive to treat, di diagnose, treat, and maintain and keep the treatment going for these people uh, up to $1 billion a year. The diagnosis is done clinical, but there are several steps for the diagnosis. Clinical, physical examination. I guarantee you, you haven't heard of this test. I've just put it for historical reasons. You know, the Brody Trendelenburg and the Perthes test, they were the tests done, I you know, 100 years ago, wrapping up the leg and see which system was incompetent. And you can read about that later. But, and, and also, you need to classify your patients. And we'll go over these points in a little while. I'm just gonna, I want you guys to wake up because I know it's late and, and you know, you might be falling asleep already. The, how you want to classify your patients? There are two systems, and we'll go over them in a minute. The revised venous clinical severity score and the C classification. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, the diagnosis, there are non-invasive tests like venous duplex ultrasound that we've been talking about for the past uh, hour or so, uh, air plethysmography. There are invasive tests like descending vin vin venography or venogram. All right, let's go back to classify your patients. There are two main ways to classify the patients that is going to dictate what are you going to do with those patients. What is the next step on, on, on this? The first one is the uh, CAEP classification that is uh, uh, clinical uh, etiology, anatomy, and pathology. And the second one is the revised venous clinical severity score. Uh, uh, Dr. Patel already touched something about uh, uh, the uh, uh, CAP classification, and we have uh, the clinical by far is the one that we use the most. So it's something that you as a fellows and physicians need to have right here, you need to have right here to know exactly where the patient is. So uh, in, in you know, all these uh, uh, levels of uh, disease, are the ones you need to manage to classify that. The E on that classification is etiology, which can be congenital, primary, secondary, or, or, or non-identified. Uh, and uh, the anatomy can be superficial system, perforator, deep system, or you might not have an idea what, what you're looking at. Oh, and, and the pathophysiology can be reflux, reflux, obstructions, or a combination of both. So the classification Z0 is normal, okay? C1, the langectaceous and or reticular. C2, varicose veins, no question about the varicose veins. C3, edema. C4, pigmentation or eczema. That's very important because this is going to be a patient that is going to be bouncing back and forth between dermatologists, primary care doctors, and you guys. So you need to know what you are looking at in order to help the patient because ultimately that's what we're here for, to help the patient. Uh, C4B, lipodermatosclerosis, that's another condition that bounces all over the place. The, the dermatologist doesn't know what it is. The primary care doctor is giving these patients antibiotics for years. Oh, you have cellulitis. Here comes another one. Here comes another one. It's not cellulitis. It might be, cellulitis might be involved with this, but it's not what it is. And it's important for you to recognize the lipodermatosclerosis and be well versed on that in the options to treatment. Uh, C5 is healed venous ulcers, and C6 is active venous ulcers. So those are the, 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 the C classification, the, the C part uh, of uh, the clinical part of the CAP classification that you need to be absolutely well versed on that. The anatomy, uh, somebody else touched on this. I'm not going to spend much time on this. But the one thing I need to say about the deep system, the iliac, and, uh, the iliac system and inferior vena cava all I always, not always, I very often forgotten 
as problems with the lower extremities. We tend to, you know, linger around the, the, from, the, uh, uh, from the common femoral down, and we ultrasound, re-ultrasound, re-re-ultrasound, and the ultrasound is the same. Maybe the problem is higher, and it's something that you guys need to keep in mind. You know, uh, uh, investigate the uh, 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 iliac system as well as the inferior vena cava. Uh, the other thing is uh, the, the sinuses are considered deep venous system. Already, I'm not going to repeat what they already did. There is no point on that. The American Venus Forum in 2000, right in the millennium, uh, decided to get together and develop the venous severity scoring system. To, in order to classify the patients in a more broad uh, uh, way than the CAP classification. And they use these three subsets of assessments to create the venous severity uh, scoring system. Uh, in 2008, because we have to do stuff, right, the American Venus Forum, Forum uh, got together again and did a revision, and that's what we usually, that's what we use currently, the revision of the Venus Clinical Severity Score. And those are the, 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 uh, the points that they revised and they changed, and basically what they did, the revision consisted in expanded uh, the pain description, a little bit more accurate the, in, 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 in uh, time, place, characteristic, and that'll give you a better idea, the size of the vein, uh, the edema, the extent, the involvement, just minor changes, but definitely will help the classification and how to diagnose these patients. Uh, this is an old picture of the Brody Trendelenburg test. I was, I, I show you earlier, but most likely nobody else here knows except Dr. Lomsen and Mike Silva and myself uh, how to do this. This is just an old clinical way to diagnose uh, venous insufficiency, separate from the superficial uh, from the deep as well as the perthes, but I'm not going to extend on this because you're never going to do this anymore unless you go to some rural area that Texas City. I'm sorry? Like Texas City. Yeah, like, like the, yeah, like Galveston or somewhere. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, so anyway, so what is the, what is the, the, the diagnostic of choice? Venus duplex ultrasound, but this is the key. Not everybody does it correctly. You need to be very well versed in ultrasound, so you can tell when an ultrasound was done correctly or not. Back then, when Dr. Lomsen was our our uh, our mentor, we used to spend I don't, how much is there like three to six months in the vascular lab, and we took call. We used to do come to the Methodist Hospital at night to do the ultrasounds. We really got uh, uh, involved with this, and that is what is going to give you the comfort and the confidence that you are looking at a test and knowing if it's accurate or not. The reflux ultrasound for venous insufficiency is not a test that can be done like that. It takes anywhere between one hour and uh, up to two hours. It depends how the, the, the body habitus of the patient, how, if you are taking uh, ultrasound in the two limbs or just one. So it's important, it's important because based on this, you are gonna make the decision how to treat the patient. Based on this, you need to, you need to trust that uh, uh, well. The other uh, alternative is the uh, air platysmography. We are not going. To, I just have three minutes and 39 seconds, so let's keep going. Uh, uh, descending venography. You can see in this uh, slide uh, a normal uh, deep venous insufficiency, the femoral vein, and the super and the superficial venous insufficiency, the greater saphenous vein. Uh, the controversy of all the time, you know, venography versus IBOS. IBOS is superior. That's it. You don't have to dig anymore. You will have enough time in your residence, your fellowship, to memorize the numbers, and you can take the boards and give them the right numbers. But the IBUS is obviously superior that that venography. Uh, Non-surgical treatment for venous insufficiency, lifestyle, weight loss. We live in an, in an era of political correctness. That you have a 350 pounds patient walking into your office and telling you, I don't know why my knee hurts. <laughs> And we can't say anything. We're like, uh, maybe your shoes, perhaps? <laughs> there are ways that you can address these patients and tell them what they need. Use your, your position in society to help these people and wake them up from slumber and, and tell them, you need to lose weight. Otherwise, this is not going to work. 
use whatever it takes. It's important the role in the, uh, the, uh, that we play in society, and this is one of them. So please, please, don't play the game of political correctness. That's the, just be gentle, don't tell them me, because then lawyers are not fun. So you, you know, <laughs> be gentle, but tell them what it is. Exercise and leg elevation. By the way, these two exercise and leg elevation it's important that you document that on Medicare patients because Medicare will require that documented before they approve any further treatment. So uh, it's important. Uh, other type of compressions, you, uh, stockings, una boot, and pneumatic pump. Rule of thumb, I agree with uh, Mike Silva. I think he was, uh, this is the average, um, uh, the rule of thumb for compression. You can read there. I'm not going to read the slide. You can read. Uh, but basically, I agree with Mike Silva. Nobody is going to wear 30 millimeters of mercury in Houston. That's the rule. That's my rule of thumb. So I'd rather give something suboptimal to those patients, 15 to 20, that I know darn well is not what they need, but the way it's more likely they are going to use it. Okay. So it's important that you accommodate uh, all that uh, treatment for your patients. Uh, this is a brief history of Jobs, it, how he uh, uh, discovered compression to. Uh, uh, treat venous insufficiency. He had venous stasis ulcers himself, had a swimming pool. Every time he got into the pool, more often and more often, the ulcers got better, and then he realized that the pressure was helping, and is how he developed all this uh, compression system. Uh, then uh, also the una boot is another alternative uh, that will help you heal all the ulcerations that patients might have. Um, I have 40, 39 seconds. Let's you get an going. extra minute. Yeah, you're doing fine. Uh, I know you, Mike. I, I you better hurry up, man, you because you're going to call the cops on me in a minute. So anyway, uh, treatment. The side of insufficiency in limbs with ulceration most of the time is just superficial venous system. It's the only thing you need to take out of this. But do not forget that also proximal veins are involved in ulcerations that are, that are relentless, that are resilient, that you cannot heal. Don't forget to check the iliac system or the inferior vena cava. Very important to remember. Uh, regarding surgical options for venous insufficiency, valve repairs, uh, valve transfers, and vein uh, segmental transposition, I'll show you a picture of that. This is a, uh, a comparison of two valves. One is normal, the other one is not. After having a clot, it has scar tissue damage, the valve is floppy, it doesn't work. This is, uh, again, a floppy valve after damage, and the technique about the reefing sutures, which, which I haven't done. I, I, I never done one, so I'm being honest with you because, you know, it's important coming here. Oh, I've done, no, I've done it. I haven't done it. So this is supposed to be the results nicely from a book, as you can see. These are not my pictures, but it's supposed to work that way. Axillary vein transfer, that's uh, an alternative we have for severe venous insufficiency when you can take, can take the segment of the axillary vein that contains the valve and transpose it into the vein that is affected in lower extremities. And the next, the next slide is going to explain to you, uh, we are obviously at the saphenofemoral junction, and those are the three uh, options. The repair, the uh, vein, the, the um, uh, axillary, uh, the valve transfer, and this is the transposition. When you take the incompetent vein and you, sw you, 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 you basically switch that vein, you anastomose, below a different vein that has a competent valve. Good luck. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> rule of thumb about the levels of treatment. When you are proximal inside the pelvis in the iliac system, you can use angioplasty, stent. Uh, when you are going into the groin and maybe a little bit lower in the femoral vein, you can use endophlebectomy, which is the, it's like the endarterectomy of the veins. You remove all the scar tissue to, leave, to open up that vein. Uh, and obviously transposition, we just mentioned that in the lower, in the lower vein, saphenous, uh, shorter femoral vein and greater saphenous vein. Post-thrombotic post syndrome, few words about this, is, up to, is presented up to 40% of the patients that have an episode of DVT. Um, it, it is, no matter what you do, is going to be a problem like Dr. Silva mentioned earlier. This is a very complex subset of patients that, uh, is, is going to be difficult to manage, and it's going to require a very, very close teamwork between the patient 
and yourselves. You need to involve the patients. Don't feel that you have to fix stuff all the time. They need to do stuff. There is so much you can do. And the more straightforward you are, the more honest you are with them, the better results you are going to have and better expectations and happier the patient is going to be if that sort of thing exists in patients with post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, again, don't forget about the iliac system. That can be significant, can, can disable patients in a significant way, resulting in venous claudication and, you know, another myriad of, uh, of, of uh, clinical presentations that are not, not fun to see. Um, about 20 to 30 percent of all the iliac veins recanalized, that's it. The rest either remain occluded or, or highly stenosed. So, don't, you know, venogram or IVAS is, IVAS is important to diagnose. The, uh, the site where the iliac veins might be affected, and then you treat it accordingly with, uh, like Dr. Silva mentioned, angioplasty stent. Normally, uh, you can do the wall stent from Boston Scientific. Normally, works there, okay. But um, it's important. Don't in, when you stent iliac veins or, 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 or veins for that matter, don't be shy. Normally, the vein is going to require a larger stent than you will think. So, in order to stay patent later on, if you put like if you follow the same rules that when you do when you stand arterial uh, uh, arteries is is not gonna is not gonna be funny it's not gonna be it's not gonna be uh, easy to uh, to um, follow up that patient with recurrent thrombosis and so forth. Uh, okay, deep venous rec deep venous reconstruction. You need to be on the thing. Don't don't. Don't just jump into the case. You need to think what you're doing. Uh, what am I expecting here? Uh, is this patient going to bleed? Is this patient going to clot? Uh, have already done the, the simple things first. Sometimes in these cases, the simple things are the best and work better for the patient in long term. I know you are eager to cut legs and open veins, and but trust me, you are going to open the kind of worms that you don't want to deal with later on in time. So start with the simple things uh, and treat the patient accordingly. You know, if this is somebody that has a life-threatening situation, I mean, by all, by all means, go ahead and take care of it. Uh, but, but it's important. The yeah. last one is I learned the hard way. In here, are there any old guys around to help? Which is a good segue into Dr. Lumsden's talk, which is next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. We still got units. Yeah. yeah. So, so it is. It is important. Sorry, yes. Important to do that. Uh, anyway, so if you must, if you must treat the patients with this condition, make sure that you document everything. Make sure that you have all the use of every single uh, tool at your disposal, diagnostic, uh, all the consultants that you can, and. Tell the patient the truth. Don't, don't, don't just raise expectations in order to get the case because you will get burned. Don't do that.